the lands of the Far East are green and bountiful, overflowing with the riches of the soil. In pre-war days, their vast plantations yielded the bulk of the world's rubber supply. The rich latex from the rubber trees, in peacetime an essential commodity, became with war's outbreak an urgent and vital raw material. December 7, 1941. Quickly and violently, our chief supply sources were cut off. The surge of Japanese armies engulfed Malaya and the East Indies. In the 100 days between Pearl Harbor and the fall of Java, the United Nations were blasted out of the lands which once supplied them with their fighting rubber. And so in Canada, 7,000 miles from the captured sources of natural rubber, men turned to science and began to build towards self-sufficiency through synthetic rubber. A mile outside the city of Sarnia, Ontario, they threw into high gear one of the great building projects of Canada's history. Sprawled over 185 acres, the skeleton of the new Canadian government company known as the Polymer Corporation began to take shape. The equivalent of 10 separate factories, it was a city in itself. It was the genius of the chemists which made synthetic rubber commercially possible. Silently working to solve the problem of creating the gummy latex, they gave to the new industry the experience of their collective wisdom. Construction was a back-breaking struggle, waged by an army of 5,000 workers of many racial origins. There were French and English, Americans, Poles, Czechs, Indians, men and women from all over the world. They worked night and day, seven days a week, foregoing even Christmas in a hazardous race against time. From the moment when the first tree was felled on uncleared land in June 1942 until the day when the first batch of government synthetic rubber rolled out in September 1943, a weird mechano-like city of steel grew into being. With its pattern of pipes and towers, its storage tanks, spheres and smokestacks, it is an engineer's vision of tomorrow's world become a present reality. Polymer is now rolling out the rubber, two kinds, butyl and buna S, miraculous chemical conversions from the cracked ends of petroleum. Vast quantities of raw materials are used, 45 billion gallons of water a year and enough coal to heat 75,000 homes. Through a network of pipes and tanks, the hydrocarbon gas isobutylene is converted into flexible butyl rubber. At the tail end of the butyl process, workers watch over the dewatering of the gleaming black mass which comes sausaging out of the extruder. They feed it through the rolling mills, then ribbon it onto the conveyor belt. Along the conveyor, the streamer of flexible rubber moves forward to the cutting and stacking machine and the sheets of butyl are boxed and shipped in steady succession to the manufacturer. For rubber life rafts, butyl has become a satisfactory substitute for the natural rubber. Likewise, it is being used as a protective covering in electric wiring. And for products such as gas masks and anti-gas clothing, the resiliency and the resistance of butyl are proving of great value. From the 165-foot extraction tower flows a gas essential to the manufacture of the tough Buna S. To make 34,000 tons a year of this rubber, the chemists combine two hydrocarbons, styrene and butadiene. 
The great barren reactor room holds the heart of this process and is automatically charted and controlled 24 hours a day. Its reaction is the phenomenon of polymerization, that is, the combining of many hundreds of single molecules into one large molecular chain. The chemists literally make the molecule grow. With the aid of a secret catalyst, certain double bonds which hold the atoms of the molecule together are forced to open up and form new bonds. This step is repeated over and over again. The new bonds multiply to form larger and larger chains, many hundred times their original length. And this is the secret of the elasticity, which is rubber. The polymerized latex pours down into a vat where it coagulates in split second time into soft springy crumbs of Buna S. A fountain of water playing on a rolling filter washes the fresh rubber. Rollers squeeze it partially dry. The semi-dried pieces fall onto the conveyor and are carried upwards to be dumped into an oven which dries the mass. Then the Buna lumps are broken up again in the crumbing machine and fed into the baler. Out from the baler come solid cakes, 75 pounders, which have been hydraulically pressed into uniform blocks. The bales of synthetic rubber are now ready for shipping to the factories, there to be milled, compounded and processed into tire casings, strong and tough to resist the poundings of an army on wheels. Polymer's rubber can now take its place with the older products as a full-fledged member of the Canadian economy, a notable addition in war and peace to the nation's industrial life. <laughs>